hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, keep talking. I'll be on the floor slobbering like a dog. Can you hear me? So am I coming out, coming through the speakers there? Okay. Okay. So then that'll record it for us two minutes. We'll have Dale Pocock, how are you doing? Doing good. What's that? you do that? I don't know what's going on. It's a chat thing going on here. It's, uh...
Hey, uh, can we go ahead and get started? I'll wait for Kim. Hey, good evening, everyone. Good evening. <laughs> hey, welcome to the April meeting of the Sandusky River Valley Beekeepers. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, hey, the meeting minutes that were just sent out uh, a couple of weeks ago for our last meeting. Uh, can I have a motion to approve those meeting minutes? I have a second. Thank you. Uh, Tammy, can we have the treasurer's report? As of today, we had $6,470 in the treasurer's account. Uh, we have two items that we need to approve. The end of the, mo the, end of the month? Well, as of today. Okay, as of today. Uh, we also had the books uh, uh, audited by the bank. We do that once a year. We just completed that this last month. Uh, so I've got some announcements I want to make. I'll go ahead. Any errors? Uh, well, <laughs> the gentleman that looked at them said that, that they were fine. <laughs> I'm not an accountant. I, I, <laughs> hey, I, I have some announcements I want to make. Uh, so last Saturday, uh, this past Saturday, we just completed the 2022 uh, beginner beekeeping class. Uh, you know, we had the initial class uh, on February the 19th, and that covered all the classroom stuff. And so doing something new this year, we brought everybody back for the dumping of the bees. And we made a nice video of this. We, we never really had a video in our training material that was our video. And uh, I want to thank Tom Rathbun for supporting us with that. And also Jamie Garza, she's also a member of the club, and she did the recording of the video so that we could put it in our training material. So I appreciate all the support on that. Um, also, I want to thank uh, Kim Root. She's, she's been working hard to get our club brochure uh, revised. And so it's just about ready to go to the printer. We plan to revise it every couple of years, but this gives us something to hand out when we go out and do public presentations. And uh, so it was due for a revision. It, it hadn't been revised since about 2018. So thank you, Kim. We have a couple of copies if people do want to look at it. Good. We have a couple of copies. You can look at it after the meeting. Uh, also, bees are still available if you need bees this year. Uh, I think Tom still has two more dates, three more, three more for bees. Uh, if you need bees, you can go to olddrone.net and order them there. That's one way to get them. There's other folks in the area that sell bees. Uh, I wanted to mention the public events that we've got going on uh, for the month of April. Uh, first of all, we got Earth Day, and that's coming up on April 23rd. The club's going to have a table there, and John Schick's not here, but I want to thank him. Uh, he made arrangements to get the club a place to put our tent, and we're going to set up right next to John. And uh, I also want to thank Jamie Scott uh, Hummingford. Uh, she's also a club member, and she sent me an email and said, hey, I'd like to help out with that. So if anyone else would like to help out with Earth Day, it'll just be at a table and talking to the public uh, about beekeeping. It's gonna be at Osborne Park on February the 20th, I'm sorry, April the 23rd. Dale, you wanna be part of that? All right, I'll send you an email. Uh, also on uh, April the 27th, uh, Tammy and I is going to be doing a presentation to a group out of Norwalk. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's from like an adult uh, group home. And uh, we still have the barn set up for the class. And so they're just going to come to the barn and we're going to do a presentation there about just beekeeping in general and honey and pollinators. 
And uh, then we're also still trying to set up the date for the veterans home. So the, the veterans group and Sandusky also wanted to come down to the barn and uh, we were gonna do the same presentation for them. So that's what we got going on for April. Uh, yeah, I remind the club that our main mission is to educate the public about beekeeping, the importance of bees, pollinators, and how important bees is to our food supply and the environment. Also, I wanna remind you that after the meeting, we're gonna have door prizes over here that'll be given away, so don't rush out. Also, if you haven't signed in, make sure that you're signed in on the sign-in sheet up here. And one other thing, a couple other things I wanna mention, uh, committees. Um, so right now we have two committees that we've started and uh, we have one committee that's looking into getting our new shirts and hats with our logo. And uh, the folks on that committee is uh, Doug and Becky Ritchie and uh, Rosemary Clifford, I'm sorry. Rosemary, I'm, I'm 64, come on, give me a break. <laughs> I just turned 64. Doug, you want to give us an update on what's going on with that? <laughs> I'm Doug Ritchie. Uh, my wife Becky and Rosemary Clifford on the Merchandise Committee. We're looking at uh, getting some products with our logo on it. We're talking to some different vendors. And what we're looking at is some hats, some polos some t-shirts and maybe a jacket. And in the next month, we'll have everything already. And to our payment, we're gonna be asking for payment at the time of order. So we don't run into any problems. More to come. Good. Thank you, Doug. Thank, thank you, group. Yeah, Dale. We're, we're staying away from black fire. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, where's the adventure, right? <laughs> hey, uh, so we another committee that we're just starting now, I've asked uh, Chris Earnhardt to uh, begin putting together a nominations and elections committee. And that is the one committee that's mentioned in our bylaws. And so you can imagine the purpose of that committee is to identify people within the club or club members who would want to be future directors or officers. Uh, we'd like to identify those folks so we can uh, you know, get to know them and uh, know that they're interested so we can elect them. So. Anybody's interested. <laughs> 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 that was my cue. Yeah. 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 I guess, <laughs> but, but anyhow, Ooh. yes, a, a group that we can meet together in the back after every meeting and, and look at folks and, and see because of like, you know, as to President Wiley says, you know, this is your club and we'd like to get more involvement. Um, I always mentioned Doc Stone. Doc there used to come in and sit at the seat back there all the time. Come in, open up the soap pad, take his notes. And so one day I just said, Sam Hill or you know, <laughs> you, you know, you're taking notes and stuff. And, and we got to know him well. And, and he's grown immensely in the club and also helped us out very, very much with, uh, with the IT. Um, there's probably somebody that I'd also like to look for to take his place a little bit as, as an IT person. Um, that's not an elected position, but 
somebody who would be able to do what God does and all this magic. So, you know, if you're interested, be on our committee on that. We're not going to have meetings every week or monthly or anything like that. I just plan on having before or after the meeting, start looking for folks that can get on the first one of the, the B Club lab. Yes. Pass the well. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Hey, I think, the, I think the message is important, though, that this is our club. You know, the, the members sitting here, I mean, this the club will be what we, you know, the direction that we take it. So, and the more people that's involved, you know, the, the better the outcomes will be. So, and I believe that. I think it's important. Also, I want to mention as we, as we get more and more into doing public presentations, uh, we, we have PowerPoint presentations. You know, this last year, we've developed our own training material for our B class. Actually, it was last year. And so uh, I was pretty excited about that. I mean, we have our own training material now, and uh, we're going to have uh, PowerPoints for folks to go out and do a presentation with. We'll have brochures. We'll have trinkets, like if, you're, if you got kids there and stuff. So once again, that's part of our mission is to educate the public. So. So with that, she said, with the vets program, are the hives around their homes or in Sandusky? Oh, uh, the vets program is really just an informational program. There's no beekeeping um, instruction or anything like that. It's, it's really just high level beekeeping, the importance of bees to our food supply, the environment, Honey, the byproducts of, of bees. Yeah. yeah, Doug. Just one question. Do we know how many paid members we have at this point? Yes, right now we have 115 uh, paid memberships. So, all right. So, I want to, uh, one other thing I want to mention, uh, Carl. Uh, Carl Bruns is here. Carl is our new Sandusky County uh, Bee Inspector. And so Carl, welcome. We, uh, we had an article uh, on Carl in the newsletter this last month. And uh, Carl, I don't think you've even got all your indoctrination or everything done yet, right? <laughs> okay. Okay, well, welcome. We're glad you're here tonight. So I look forward to getting to know you. All right. Has everybody signed in? Okay. Okay, we're good. How are you doing? So for tonight, uh, what we're talking about is we're, we're gonna do a presentation tonight on spring management. And uh, you know, when we started looking at spring management, it encompasses such a broad area. And so I'm gonna lead out as kind of the facilitator of this, but uh, I asked Tom Rathman, uh, Evelyn Lippard, uh, Terry Lowe, I asked them to kind of be our, our panel answering questions. So you, it, you guys just want to sit back there. You can sit up here. It doesn't matter. <laughs> All right, you can sit there. Just so we can hear them on the mic, that'll be the big thing. Yeah, the yep. Zoom people won't be able to hear them otherwise. So. Yeah, you, you know, the. I guess I guess we can take them on mic. I don't know. Oh, yeah, we can. We'll take them here. OK, uh, so what we're going to do, uh, we're going to break spring, ma uh, spring management up into two sessions. Uh, you know, I promised the group that I would try to have us out of here around eight o'clock every week. And so, uh, so tonight we're going to cover a big chunk of this, and then we're going to finish it up at the May meeting. And we're going to kind of lay it out the way that the season would go. And that'll make more sense as we get into it. 
Um, I can't take credit for this material. This is uh, this PowerPoint. I put it together from material that came from Dana Stallman. And uh, Dana had Dana's presentation. And I really like this because he says, you know, every spring is like a new beginning for, for a beekeeper. You know, you think about everything that happened last year, everything you learned, everything that went well, everything that didn't go well. What Dana Stallman is saying is, you know, when it comes to spring management, it's a new beginning. It's a new year. You know, spring management sets us up for a successful beekeeping year. The goal is to, is to make all of our hives stronger. You know, we want to find those weak hives. We want to equalize that strength across the bee yard. That's what we'd like. And what I'm really doing is setting myself up for a great honey harvest. And this is where, you know, the list can go on and on about all these different tasks. Some of them we'll talk about tonight, some of them we won't, some of them we won't talk about at all, but I start right out with examining, cleaning, and storing my dead out hives. You know, I often start this back in the winter if I know that I've got a dead out, I can start this a lot earlier in the year, but it is part of the spring management this is also an important topic that I'd like to do at a future meeting is to talk about uh, evaluating your beehives to find out, try to find out why they died. So I've got that on a list for a future meeting. I want to talk about undoing hive winterization, feeding the bees, hive inspections, identifying weak bees or weak hives. I want to talk about assessing the queen's health hive maintenance, and providing expansion space. That's what I want to talk about tonight. And if we have difficult questions, we have a couple of subject matter experts that, that'll jump right in to save me uh, with, with some good answers. So this is it. This is the crux of it, March, April, May. And uh, it's, it's unpredictable. How many of you got out there? You see that 70 degrees? First weekend in March, we had, we had a Saturday that was 70 and a Sunday that was in the 60s. How many of you, how many of you had that feeling that I want to get right out there in those hives and start rotating those brood boxes? How many of you felt like I need to get in the hives today? Winter's over. So... What I did uh, the other night is I, I looked at the high temperatures for all of March and look what I found. We had five days in the 70s, four days in the 60s, five days in the 50s, six days in the 40s and 11 days below 40 for a high. And let me tell you, these, these 11 days when it was below 40, more of those were at the end of the month than at the beginning of the month. So my point is, is March is unpredictable. You know, it's a time that, at least in my bee yard, I pay most attention to feeding, making sure they got food. I don't get too crazy with tearing things apart or anything. So, anybody else feel that way? March? All right. Feeding bees. This is another topic we're not going to spend a lot of time on. We have copies up here of the newsletter from last month. We put out a comprehensive article on A to Z to B feeding. And we have copies up here if you, if you want that. Uh, I would tell you this time of the year, keep an eye on the food stores in your hives. Uh, you know, make sure your bees aren't going to starve to death. Hive winterization. You know, you're moving toward that first hive inspection. Uh, I put, uh, I wrap my hives in this EPOA, real thin underlayment. It's, it's black. It's really just really the, uh, I hope that it'll give them a tenth of a degree advantage when the weather gets really cold, when the sun's hitting them. It's really thin, easy to work with. Use the same pieces year to year. Uh, but I got to take those off before I do my hive inspections. I'll tell you right now, I'm hoping by uh, late April, I'm doing hive inspections. Uh, that, that's the way the weather feels to me today. And so I feel like I might be lucky. 
if I'm in them by the end of April. Something else that's pretty important to recognize, and we're already seeing this in, a, in, in at least one of our really strong hives from last year. You know, the sugar board spacer that you put on top of your hive, on one of our hives, we've already got the queen and, and her cohort that is filling that up with comb. So, I, so now I have a sugar board that's partially eaten away and it's full of comb, which has also got eggs and the queen's probably up there too. So it just goes along with the territory. Um, the bees are gonna do what the bees wanna do. But when I get ready to take this hive apart, this is a recovery that I'm gonna have to do by very gently going in the top of that hive and removing that comb, making sure that I don't dislodge my queen and lose her. Make, anybody else ever see that? Tom? Yeah, so last year we had a few of these, but I felt like we were kind of slow with getting on our hives. But uh, so this, this is a problem. Everybody, everybody hear me? Okay. Okay, hive inspections. We should really start hive inspections as soon as the weather permits. I like it to be 60 degrees before I'm out there doing hive inspections. Uh, the bees will be flying. Well, I like to see more 60 degree days than below. Go ahead, Tom. 60 degree days are good if you put 60 degrees till 7 o'clock in the morning. But then you have all day for that night to get warm. Wait till 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And it's 60 degrees. It's been 48, 50, 55, 60 at 4 o'clock. Then at 5 o'clock, it's going the other way. And you tear that hive apart, that whole hive, you've got to build up that heat again. So, yeah. I wouldn't do it just because it's 60 degrees. It's going to be 60 degrees in the early part of the day and then warm up from that time on. Uh, you know, just because we got a 60 degree day, we still get 38 degree nights. Yeah. So, you know, just I wouldn't do any inspection for, for a while. Yet. Yeah. It's just too early for that. Unless the weather changes drastically and we get 75 degree days and it's hot, we're complaining about how hot it is. Well, I know at least for the next 10 days, the nightly lows is down in the 30s and 40s. I mean, we're still down there. Evelyn, do you think you can get your bees sooner with your arrangement at all with the weather? Evelyn, mm -hmm. yeah. can you stand up and just mention how you take care of it? Any other discussion on this? Yeah. I'll, I'll be the oddball here. Um, we've been at the hives two or three times, four down eight splits. Um, we're going to be shaking packages here next week. Um, if it's 48 degrees or warmer and, it, and it's not uh, windy, I'll be in. But my bees come from California, they got more fruit, more bees to work with, they work up quicker. So, I mean, I don't know what everybody else's hives are looking at and gotten in here. But we got I don't know, maybe six strains of cat food right now, and then there's there's eggs and larvae at different stages right now. And we've been in them, we've working pretty good. And I haven't noticed any chill brood or, or anything getting pulled out of the hive. So I I mean I'm not saying I disagree with it, but I don't know where your guys' hives are at right now. So I'm used to stuff coming from California right now. 
that's what, what I'm doing right now. Just different perspective. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good perspective that, yeah, I think uh, all of our hives have been sitting in the Ohio winter. Yeah. Hey, Carl. Yeah. Can, uh, can you give us a little bit of background on where you're coming from? Like, how many hives and more of a commercial outfit? Oh. Is this? time be better. Thanks, Carl. All right. So let me move out of the way here so you guys can see this. Uh, hive inspections. Uh, we like to look and evaluate the bee population. We're really looking for weak hives is what we're looking for. Um, And I use this example here uh, that Dana put in here. So here's a hive that's got, that's got three frames of bees. Any of you ever find one of your hives like that in the spring? Yeah. Yeah, three frames of bees. Uh, the bees made it through the winter. Uh, they may or may not have a queen. I doubt whether they have a queen, but uh, the bee population is small. Their chance of survival is not very good uh, without some help. So, and just looking at the frames, this, this, uh, I put these in here, this, this weak frame or weak hide frame, you'll see bees on it, but you really don't see anything else. You know, you don't see, uh, you don't see the eggs, cat brood, you don't see any honey. Uh, in fact, the frame's not even completely drawn out. And if you can, if you compare that to the frame from a strong hive, you know, you're looking at a frame that's got honey, brood, eggs, uh, you know, big difference. Uh, again, this, this weak hive is probably, it's not gonna make it unless I take some kind of action to help it. What, what's some of the things I can do? I find this, I find this, uh, this uh, brood box, I got a two brood box hive and I find three frames in the top of bees and that's all I got. What, what can I do? Combine. Yep, I can combine them. That's, that's, I can, uh, so I can take these three frames and I can combine them with another hive. One thing, go ahead. Couldn't you go to Carl, take some of his, he'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you could, 
you know, you, you can discuss that with Carl, but I'm telling you, I saw some articles on Ohio Beekeeper about what was going on in California. I don't know. I think I'd stay out of another guy's bee yard. <laughs> Tom, what do you think? What, what should I do? Well, that's a good question. We're going to have to find out if we have a queen. Um, let's say we do. Yeah, well, let's say we do. Let's, let's move along. Um, so this weak hive, you know, I'm going to have to get these bees with a bunch of other bees if I think they're going to survive. Uh, I need to make sure they got brood available so they can, the, their population of bees can continue to grow. Uh, hopefully I'm one of these beekeepers that's got a, you know, four, five, six, 50 hives where I can maybe steal from one hive and put in another. If I've only got one hive, I'm probably in trouble. Okay, because I need some bees. Uh, and once we do get this straightened out, we're going to have to feed them to make sure that they live. Let's keep going here. Yeah. Well, in the spring, well, right now, I'm going to let my panel answer this. Now, I, go ahead, Tom. Well, I, what I'm doing for feeding right now is I'm still, I, I've still got sugar boards in my hives. And I'm making sure that they have, uh, that nobody's running out of, uh, of sugar uh, or patties or whatever I'm using. I've also been putting out pollen sub. Uh, I put that out in, in uh, buckets around the bee yard. I, I let the bees fly to get it. Uh, I, I've, got, uh, I've got water out. Uh, I put my pools of water out in the bee yard, in the bee yards. And because uh, I will have some warm days when they're flying. And if they want water, I, I want it there available for them. I haven't put any uh, syrup or anything like that on them. Does anybody do syrup in the spring? Okay. Yeah, when it gets warm. You know that we still got a lot of time here when we're down below 45 degrees where the bees will be clustering. So, you know, that's what I'm doing is I, I went heavy on the sugar on the sugar board in the fall. And we're still making sure, of course, some of our highs are still eating their honey. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I haven't put anything other than that on the hive. So some people use them, you can, you can buy those. Uh, what I will tell you though is, uh, and Tom, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but uh, one risk with pollen patties going later in the, in the spring is, Hide beetles like them. So you got to keep a close eye on them. So, yeah. Yeah, the higher protein patties. That answer your question? Okay. Lots of different things you can do. You can put sugar right on top of the grain if you wish. Uh, you can find your tanning. You, know, you can buy fondant in a uh, we'll fuelers. The fuelers are going to be down in the tank room. The fuelers are tiny. They cater to beekeepers uh, where you can buy a 50 pound block of fondant. And uh, you know, only got one or two hives that. 50 pound block of fun that's been lasting forever. But you just, uh, what I always used to do is uh, take a big spoonful, make it about the size of a softball, and it's, it's fairly hard. You know, I just keep it in the basement, wrapped up in the box that it comes in. And I might put that spoonful in a microwave for like 10 seconds just to kind of loosen it up. 
put it between wax paper, roll it out with a rolling pin, and put the wax paper and all right on top of your eyes, on top of the frame. And the bees leave the paper off, they pull it outside, they'll fit into that. Uh, that's just another form of sugar for them. Um, if you got a sugar board on top, you can put dry sugar in it, or you can make up a sugar board and put it in it. Uh, I would be a little careful about putting syrup out right now, just because, and especially if you don't have a inner feeder, you got like a, a boardman feeder that's sitting out front. Uh, you know, when it gets real cold, the bees are clustered inside, you're not going to go outside. And, Sure. Yeah. Yeah, don't eat it. I mean, you know, I always used to say with these sugar boards, and I've said it several different times, us as humans can live off of a Snickers candy bar. It's not the healthiest thing in the world that you can live off of a Snickers candy bar. That's the same thing with the sugar. You know, it's not the healthiest for the bees. It was much for That's a right. and that sugar. Yeah. You know, power for the uh, young bees and the nectar. But uh, they will survive for sure. All right, we're going to continue. Hey, somebody brought up uh, the queen. So, you know, I got this weak hive. Uh, right now, it's pretty important. I determine do I have a queen and what's she doing? Um, you know, the, the success of the hive is going to be driven by that queen. You know, if you don't have any eggs, you don't have any cat brood, if, if the queen's not doing her job or if she's missing, there's gonna be a problem. You know, we gotta have a good queen. Uh, failing queens need to be replaced. Now, how am I gonna know if a queen's failing? Ask her, Ask her? <laughs> okay. Well, I'll tell you just the fact that I got three frames of bees. I mean, that's a great big warning sign for me already. I, you know, there, I shouldn't be in a position where, let's say I'm going through my bee yard and I've checked 30 hives, and then I come upon this, this hive that's got three frames of bees in it. And uh, like I said before, first I doubt whether there's a queen in there, but if she's in there, uh, there's something, something's wrong. And uh, so the main thing is if a queen's failing, she needs to be replaced. Well, it's nice to have two hives anyhow. So you got one to compare it to. You know, this one's busting with bees and this one isn't doing anything at all. They should be kind of equal if the queen is doing what she's supposed to be doing. Uh, but you know, if you've only got one hive, then you know, maybe take some pictures of it and show another beekeeper or something and uh, figure out something that way. You know, that's one of the benefits of of being part of the club is when you when you encounter something that you're just not sure about. It's always good to be able to pick the phone up and call somebody that you know, and then just bounce it off them. Hey, this is what I got. This is what I think. What do you think? And uh, I found that to be very helpful. You know, I have a solution. Everybody's got a solution. I mean, it's the old uh, saying you ask the same question to 10 different beekeepers, you're going to get 10 different answers. So it's just what I do works for me. And that's what I like to talk about. Yep. You know, what works for Gary, what works for anybody else is just, hey, that's great. If it works, work, you know, run with it. Yep. So it's just solutions and ideas for different problems. Yeah, I put this slide in here that talking about a good queen. Uh, you know, when I first started out beekeeping, I would read about queens that would last five, six years, four years. But then I got to thinking, you know, if a queen's four years old or five years old, do I really want to risk going through another year with her? I don't have an answer for that, but at least I've answered that question for myself. And you know, I'll just tell you in our bee yards, I, you know, if a queen's two years old, she's she's getting old. But that's the way I take care of it. Tammy and I don't always agree on this, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have the standing joke about with me having a hide tool stuck in my back. <laughs> you know, 
when you're, you know, when you're, when you're retired and your wife and you kind of does this together, you know, you, you don't always completely agree on everything. And, and she's got a hive tool. I'll tell you, this is a killer hive tool. So. <laughs> You know, it, it, we've had some pretty good discussions out in the bee yard. Okay, so we talked about some choices. Somebody brought up a weak hive uh, that you could take those bees, add them to a stronger hive. Yeah, I listed that up here too. Uh, I could take frames from other healthy hives and boost that hive up. You know, another thing I like to do is reduce the hive space. If I've got a problem with a hive, let's say I got three frames of bees, I'm more likely to take those three frames and make a nuke out of it. Uh, that's generally what I do whenever I've got something like that. Uh, I certainly don't want them left in two brood boxes. It's way too much room. Uh, so I like to reduce the space on a weak hive until I see them beginning to recover. Maybe I put a new queen in there. Now I'm seeing, you know, a couple of frames of cat brood, you know, and, and I'm looking at this, I might even add a second story to that nuke and then reach the point where I put it back in a, in a big hive. But that's the way I generally handle it. If you take a frame from another one, will the worker bees fly to their poles uh, struck that, uh, that hive? It's a great question. What? And only be so so uh, if, if uh, if I take a frame of bees from this hive and walk them over here and put them in this hive, what do you think? What are they going to do? Well, I, I would tell you that they're probably both. Yeah, I, that, that's what I've always been taught. The, I got foragers who are probably going to return back to their original hive. I have nurse bees. I'm, it's likely that They'll, they'll generally stay, but it's still a problem because I'm trying to get bee, uh, bees from one hive over to another to boost up bee population. So at least in our bee yards, what I do is when I, when I take bees from a hive and put them in another hive, I take that hive and take it to another bee yard. But that's what I do. I'm able to do that. But we got more solutions here coming up. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Put a stick across the entrance. Yeah, that changes What's the question, Jerry? No, it's just about the bees going back to their original hive. Uh, so one idea is to put put something across the entrance so the bees will recognize that there's something different. I've done that before with like a, like a pine branch. I've, I've took some duct, duct tape and taped a hive branch in front of the entrance of the hive. How effective it was, I don't know, but I know that people do it. Um, we talked about this one. It's probably a good idea to buy a queen. Now, if I need a queen in May, what's my options here? I can go see Carl. And it's, Carl, I think you probably have access to queens probably from the south. Florida, yeah. I can tell you what I do. It was toward the end of May, beginning of September, I realized how weak our hive was. I went up and killed the queen, and they had already killed one frame of me. The problem was they didn't have enough time to build it up for the yellow jackets that were coming, and they were decimated by the time. Yep. So that was late in the year. Okay. So now back up to the beginning of the year. Okay, so I need a queen. So I know if I buy a queen that's made around here locally, I'm probably going to be lucky to get that queen by second week in June, maybe first week in June. So if I find myself needing a queen in May, 
Also, if, if, if I want my hive to build, their, to make their own queen, what's the chances of that queen getting adequately mated around here in mid-May? Might not be that good. You know, from everything I've read about this, my point is, is if you need a queen, go buy a queen. Okay. Yeah, Terry. One thing you do is just check on how many drone cells you got in your other hive. It'll tell you what's, what, what's available out there in the, in the area. Yep. And drone cells don't waste your time. Yep, you, you can look at that. Um, I've just read, I've read articles about this though, about, you know, though genetics is way beyond me uh, and my understanding of beekeeping, but. Uh, a lot of the genetic people talk about having adequate numbers of drones so queens get adequately uh, mated when they go out. And so I think there's a lot of things to consider. Weather, I think every year here might be different. Uh, you could have a warm year, cold year. But my point is, if you need a queen, if you got a hive that's really in trouble, don't hesitate to go get a queen. Everybody with me on that? Yeah, Carl. Real quick, on the drone thing, you got to be careful with that because just because you got drone cells and you think you got, oh, I got a bunch of drones in the spring, doesn't mean that you can use them. They got to be sexually mature, they got to be hatched. I mean, here's, and that's like, I don't know, maybe 15 days. I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, if I'm wrong, some Chinese, but I think it's got to be 15 days before you're even sexually mature. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that, that you use half a month there. Hey, you're close on that drone because it takes 40 days from the time of a drone egg. When a drone egg is laid, it's 40 days before that drone is sexually mature to make it a queen. If you got like 24 days is a to it is emerge, then about another 15 to 20 days until it's sexually mature enough to so it's wild oats. One time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we talked about this weak hive. You know, we talked about adding bees. Uh, I had a couple of slides in here about, you know, there is an idea out there, uh, a thought that I could take this weak hive and put it in the position of a strong hive and move the strong hive out of the way and let forager bees come back into the weak hive as a way to increase the bee population. It's another idea. I've never done that, but I, I've talked to beekeepers that do that. But here's where we're at. The weak hive, we talked about a number of ways to address that. You know, we talked about getting more bees in the hive, reducing bee space, combining the bees with a, with a strong hive. Once that's taken care of, I got a bee yard that what I want is all my hives are to the point where they're ready to explode. These things are going to be, you know, cat brood. I mean, I'm setting myself up for a, a good year with collecting honey. Now, one of the ways, you know, the bees are going to need more room. And one of the ways that, uh, that we do that is by reversing our brood boxes. And uh, so, you know, normally what happens in the spring is I find my brood nest in the top, in the top box and the bottom brood box is essentially uh, empty of just about everything. You know, there might be a little honey left down there, but usually not very much. But most of the bees are in the top. And... Uh, Tom did, a, Tom did a, a demonstration on this about swapping brood boxes and the downfalls of doing that too early. First of all, when would you swap brood boxes? Why do you want to swap? I mean, I, there is a reason, but I just want to hear what they have to say. Yeah. Why would you want to swap your brood boxes? The brood box at the bottom of the nest again might do it. Why would 
they say that the bees like to work up, and that is kind of true, but they will work down too. I mean, but uh, you know, the thing that is a lot of, and maybe the thing that is. A lot of new beekeepers like to, they hear that we've got to swap these boxes around. And they want to do that in March. They want to do it in April. It's too early to do so. If you, if all your bees are in the top box and all your broods in the top box, and you put that top box on the bottom in March or April, and then you put that empty box on top, the bee, heat likes to go up. So they're down to that bottom, they're clustering, and they're trying to keep warm, trying to keep that bottom box warm. That top box is empty. But all that heat's going up to the top. So the bees aren't really getting much warmth down in that bottom box. If you got brood in the bottom box and you got brood in the top box and you flip the boxes around, then you're going to separate the brood. I just want to stamp. I mark that up? Yep, mark that down. <laughs> Random boxes. All right, you got brood here, like that, in both boxes. And go to rotate this box where the brood's at now. Now, where are the bees going to go to keep them warm? They're going to they'll probably stay up here. And all these are going to get killed. They're going to die. So just because it's springtime doesn't necessarily mean that you have to rotate the boxes. If um, it all depends on the weather, you know, this is my opinion. Everybody's got opinions. It depends on the weather for me. It depends on where the brood's at in the box. Um, I think maybe a little later in, for me, when I if I was going to flip it, um, let's say uh, the honey flow is coming on and they're, they're all up here. I might consider flipping it that just to give them that box on top. But, uh, you know, just to flip it just because it's everybody says so, I wouldn't do so. I mean, if it's, like I said, if the bees are all up here, you move them down here. Now they got to heat this empty box up on top. Uh, if they're all down there, you might be better off taking off that box that, and just put your lid on there and let them keep that box warm. If there's, you know, because you don't have 20 frames of bees, you know, that's another thing. I always count my frames. You got a 10 frame box, I'll count, I got bees on six frames in this box. And I go in the top box, and I'll look, and maybe only got two frames of bees. So if I got frames of bees in the top box, I got brood in that top box. And, and like I said, you go to, well, so I'm just saying now, you go to split it, you're going to have that scenario. These bees down here are going to die. So Tom, then what would you do? Are you talking about in May then? Or early June? Well, like Sharon said, you really don't necessarily have to do it. Okay. Um, I know people, they say that you should because it helps with swarm control. And, but if they already have that swarm impulse, it's going to be really hard to change their mind anyhow. And um, if, if you got a complete empty box and if you want to put, and the bees are in the top and you want to put that top box on the bottom, I would almost take that other box off for a little bit until things started to improve the weather and everything else, because uh, it's just, I don't know, you get to brood like that, you're gonna lose, you're gonna lose bees. Yeah, the, uh, Tom, thank you, I appreciate that. The, uh, I know what, at least what Tammy and I have been doing is, uh, now we normally rotate our brood boxes, uh, and, by, and what we're really doing is looking ahead at swarm prevention. And, uh, but we don't normally rotate brood boxes until the nightly temperatures are at least 50 degrees. We don't, I mean, we don't, if it's gonna be back in the 40s anytime 
the near future, we don't rotate brood boxes. But we try to set ourselves up so that the hive has plenty of room to expand because these, these hives are going to be exploding. You know, in uh, the week of Memorial Day is usually when we see swarms. If we've, if, uh, if we've had, uh, if we've had boxes or hives that we haven't split, usually Memorial Day weekend is when we'll see the first swarm. Last year, we saw our first swarm on May 15th. And so, but what we try to do to combat that is we rotate brood boxes to give more room in the hive while this bee population is exploding. And, but we don't do it until it's at least 50 degrees at night. And then along with, oh, go ahead, Tom. If it's still dropping down in the 30s, I wouldn't even consider flipping a bee. No, I, and we won't. And there, I've heard of some beekeepers doing it already. Yeah. And it's, it's you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't flip them unless the nighttime temperature was above 45 or 50. Yeah. Because, you know, you get down in the 30s and they got to warm that whole double box up if you're, you're Problems. Yeah. Well, Tammy keeps me honest on this. Uh, 50 degrees. Uh, if uh, night, the nighttime temperatures have to be, and not just a few nights, but we're in the 50 degree range. So good discussion. Other things that we do to, to give more room. I like to get my super, I like to get honey supers on. Um, once again, you know, when the nighttime temperatures are up around 50, 50 or above, I tend to get supers on my hives. I want to get as much of that nectar up top in the supers because I don't want it down in my brood boxes. So, and all this, I'm looking ahead, you know, with this giving the hive more room, I'm just looking ahead because I know that the end of May is coming. I know swarm season's coming. And so uh, with that, here's what I'll tell you. Next meeting, what we're gonna talk about, you know, we've talked about inspecting the hives, looking for weak hives. We talked about giving the hives more room, expanding brood boxes, putting on supers. Next month, what I wanna talk about, hive splits. I wanna talk about the A to Z of swarms. Why they happen, what happens when they swarm. I want to talk about getting on the mite checks and treatments. You know, getting into the getting into the bee season. You know, we got to get our focus back on mites. And uh, then also, I want to talk about uh, other the other pests, hive beetles. Yeah. I guess I'd like to ask a question of the group: Is how many uh, overwintered with one brood box, a super, and a sugar plant. Did anybody do that? And when do you add another box, depending on when the weather comes? Yeah, I mean, I, I do single high band. I just put a, a box and then put a room space here, I put a quote box, and that's it. Another mantle, you know, stop the frames. Or, Right now, probably uh, end of April, I'll probably be at. Yeah. I get splits out of those. Yep. That's interesting. I've read a lot of articles about Yeah, I, I don't mess with double boxes. Interesting. I'll have to talk to you some more. <laughs> well, it's good until I screwed up this year. So they got wet. I lost some because it got wet. I leaked the way I was doing things. I lost about eight hives. But otherwise, it was good. I was up to 12 last year, or year before. So. All right. So, do we have any questions or anything? Tell me because this is the second hive I've lost. 
although you can tell me something about what the manager is. Is that all right if I care? Sure, well, I, I don't care. I mean, we'll probably dismiss before, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, someone asked if we are starting with two nukes in May, do we really need to worry about swarms? If, you're, if they're starting, there's a question here. If somebody's starting with two nukes in May, do they really need to worry about swarms? Well, I don't know what they're doing with those nukes. You know, if they're just buying them to put them in a hive. But uh, yes, you have to work. If, first of all, if they just have nukes, nukes will swarm if they're in a nuke. That's the first thing. But uh, I've had nukes or I've bought nukes before. I mean, when you buy a nuke, I mean, these things are, they're ready to explode when you put them in a hive. Tons of cat brood. And uh, I mean, it's like adding rocket fuel to the hive. And so can you get a hive that'll swarm if you put a nuke in this year? Yeah, you can. So, you know, it's important to do hive inspections and see what's going on in the hive. So, any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> hey, that, that's a loaded question. All I can, you know, as Tom said, you could ask four beekeepers and you'll get different answers. At least in our bee yard, what we do is we don't normally get into the hives until it gets to be about 60 degrees. Uh, yeah, it, consistently. And you get two different answers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 60 degrees is what I use consistently. Does it make it better that way to consider the inspection? I mean, mm -hmm. you could take the lid off and see if sure. it's eggs. You know, I mean, if you don't have to pull every frame out. Yeah, I'm, I mean, it depends on what, depends on how intrusive you're going to be. I'll tell you, throughout the winter, you know, we're, you know, we're raising lids and peeking in there and, if it's a little bit warmer, we're gonna we're we're gonna open the lid wider and take a peek at what's going on. But I'm talking more about tearing the hive down and having a look at it, separating the brood boxes and looking and seeing what's going on. A full inspection. 60 degrees is what we use. Any other questions? You know, it's uh, about four minutes after eight. I have failed you. I didn't get you guys out of here by eight o'clock. But hey, another thing I want to mention, uh, when I get together with the officers, uh, I want to talk to them about a way that you can ask us questions for like future topics. Because I've had a few people say, you know, it'd be nice to cover this. And I want to make it easy where if somebody wants to cover a certain topic, I mean, we might cover it in a newsletter. We might, we might spend 10 minutes at, at the beginning of the meeting talking about something. But if it's important to you, it's important to us. So, oh, well, I'm not. Yeah, I'm running over right now. <laughs> she said that she had some used frames to bring. In. Yep. Should you reuse them or should you throw them away? How do you, how do you tell if you should reuse them or not? Have you ever had a dead out box? Pardon me. Have you ever had a dead out? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't like to, but yeah. Okay. But I just, I just question myself if I should have or not. So. You know, and I guess it depends on how old they are, you know. But I know a lot of people say that the darker the better. Well, I don't think that's true either. But is it or isn't? It? I don't know. That just. Hey, ask four people, you get four different answers. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 
All right, hey, with that, I'm gonna adjourn the meeting. Oh, wait a minute, I'm getting the eye. I'm getting the eye. We have a ra we have a raffle. Those antiques. If anybody wants that stuff, give them to them. One has the hot.